All right, let's do it. Welcome to the Compassionate Capitalist Show. I am so excited about my guest today, who's Bill Nussy. Uh, some of you that are in the Atlanta market, actually probably a lot of you that have been listening to my show will know his name because he's just such a force within the last couple of decades uh, in Atlanta, the Atlanta ecosystem and in the innovation. And one of those people that all of his successes have been completely different types of companies, you know, seeing the opportunity and, and just going after it. So we're going to our main focus today is going to be on climate and climate tech and innovation and how he's bill is garnering that and and actually in some of the show notes i don't even know it's not a unicorn it's a trillion dollar opportunity so i don't even know what that is that's one of those that the 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 sea creature with the unicorn thing on it hexacorn or whatever it is i don't know i don't know but anyway let me tell you who bill is in case you don't have the benefit of my um, I feel like I'm a I'm like one of these groupie fans or something like that. I'm just tingling all over. Anyway, so Bill is a career tech CEO with multiple exits, including an IPO. He holds patents related to digital media marketing multiples. He's worked at Greylock as a venture capitalist. And then after selling his marketing tech company, Silver Pop, to IBM, he shifted roles to help lead IBM's global strategy for their CEO and SVPs which is really great because that was during the time that IBM really saw the benefit of getting outside people to come in and help them know what to do. I know that's, you know, my career there. Anyway, so uh, in 2016, he left IBM and spent the last few years creating media ventures in climate tech, namely the Freeing Energy Project. It started with his TED Talk, which grew into the number one ranked podcast on renewable energy. His new book, Freeing Energy, is a practical guide for disrupting and democratizing energy. Bill is the chairman and CEO uh, and co-founder of yet another startup, Solar Inventions, with an intention of accelerating the pace of innovation in the solar tech space. And Bill remains a dominant force in the Atlanta entrepreneur investor ecosystem as a partner at Tech Square Ventures, which is fairly new, I understand. So officially, welcome to the show, Bill. So excited to have you here. Wow, Karen, that is the single most flattering uh, introduction I've ever received. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little uh, little embarrassed, but thank you for <laughs> spinning uh, the many challenges and stupid things I've done in such a nice way. But really excited to be here. I love the fact that uh, completely coincidentally that we're both in Atlanta. And uh, I love the fact that uh, you are helping people who want to become active investors sort of be an on-ramp for that. It's such a great mission. So really excited to chat today. Okay, very good. So, uh, okay, so I always have to ask, and we're, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it because I, I really hope that you're going to come back and we're going to talk about like this, you know, the, the whole skill set of doing what you've done with these companies. But I, I have, uh, what, what, was an entrepreneur born or bred? Did you, did you just know when you finished up school that you were going to go be an entrepreneur or what, what was it that triggered you to start as an entrepreneur? Wow, I think that's a great question. I don't get asked that very often. Uh, the truth is that uh, I was so bad at sports when I was in middle school that, um, and that was very hard for a boy not to be good at sport. I mean, I was really bad. And so <laughs> I was, I had no friends. And so I wandered into the library and found a computer. And when and so if you put a ball in my hand, it's pretty sad. You Back then, if you put a computer keyboard under my fingers, it was magic. And so I just happened to, get into computers back before anybody else. And I started my first company when I was 15 in high school and oh. kind of going from there. And then I kind of liked entrepreneurism. Uh, one of the sort of secret reasons I liked it was that I had, no one was interested in me before I had my own company in high school. And then in high school, I had my own startup, which was pretty unique back then. And um, I had, you know, it sort of just was a social entree. And I said, this is cool being an entrepreneur. But then I got to college and I said, I think I'm going to keep being an entrepreneur. This is kind of cool. And so I told my parents, you know what? I'm not going to, after I graduate from North Carolina State with this fancy double E degree, I'm not going to go join one of those 50 companies that are knocking on the doors of this graduates. I'm going to go start, I'm going to go do a company. And my father said, Bill, I love you, son, but uh, you'll never be a successful entrepreneur. You just don't have what it, you don't have the tenacity is what he said. And he said, so you should go be an engineer or a psychologist. I love you. And that's what you should do. So there was no bigger motivation for me and uh, anything <laughs> yeah. in my entire life than to prove my dad wrong, rest his soul, 
Um, so he passed away just after I got into Harvard Business School, uh, just before I got into Harvard Business School, telling me that, that Bill, I love you, son, but that's a has-been university. You know, you should go get an MBA <laughs> from a more serious school. Uh, and once again, that made my decision about you know where to go to business school easy. And um, he he passed away, and I miss him. But uh, he was, but he loved me a lot, and he he believed in me, and I was able to translate that into becoming an entrepreneur, and have been so, ever since. And so it's really wonderful when uh, you know, you can surpass. I mean, and I think part of times that would like parents will have that where it's the fear they don't want you to get hurt. Yes, so they'll say things like that you know, realizing, not realizing that, you know, there's, there's an inner fire in people that, and lots of different motivations for being an entrepreneur. So, uh, and uh, I just have to, I have to share this one little story because since you're, since you on the computer side. So when I was at Emory, we had to take a, uh, we took an RPG wow. to programming class. Wow. <laughs> and I Karen, remember, be careful people are going to realize you're not 22 <laughs> years old if you say things like that i know and uh and i remember the first time i pressed the button and i was so excited that it didn't i was so afraid it was going to start dinging and everybody in that computer lab was going to like go like oh she doesn't know how to program you know and um and but i really do think it helped when i got my first job out of grads out of mba school at at IBM that I could actually say RBG to because it was still around when I oh, oh sh when I first went there so anyway so I love okay. it I love it <laughs> all right so there's a lot that I think of people misunderstand or don't understand when it comes to climate and comes to innovation and comes to you know known patterns of of you know how innovation scales and impacts and integrates and has ripple effects. So I'm just gonna throw the big softball to you that says, and hope you catch this. What does the computer industry teach us about transitioning to clean energy and what that means for energy startups? Well, the good news is I know a little bit about your question. The bad news is your metaphorical softball toss to me. I'd almost <laughs> certainly miss it if it was a real softball. I'd be watching it fly by my head. Uh, but this is why I can talk credibly about the, the question. <laughs> and and you know, there's when I when I uh, sold my company at IBM, I stepped back and I said, "What's the most interesting business I could possibly be in? What's going to be the most transformative, giganticest?" made that word up live uh, and uh, <laughs> and meaningful thing I could do. And it's, I started looking at a lot of different areas of business and clean tech, climate, clean energy specifically, really jumped to the very top of the list. And it, I liked it for personally, it appealed to me for three reasons, because, um, you know, it, there's a, a lot of smart people uh, believe the earth is in trouble and we can do something about it. Uh, uh, there's a lot even before we worry about that, there's a billion people today that have no electricity at all. And their lives are just, just, you know, they're, it's just not where they could be. And last it's the biggest business opportunity in the history of the world. And for those three reasons, you know, from the capital to the uh, compassion uh, it really captured my entire uh, everything I wanted to do. And so I, I, I started looking at it and got really excited about it. And, uh, and, and since I didn't know it, I thought, a friend said, why don't you write a book, which is how the, why Freeing Energy was born as a project. And as I looked at it more and more, I actually got less and less interested. And and so for folks that are interested like me and they, they're taking a look at it, your first couple of looks are going to look a little bit uninteresting because this is a highly regulated industry. Right. Right. This is controlled by governments, state governments and federal government, highly controlled. Uh, and uh, and where there are capitalist companies, there are gigantic utilities like here in the South Southern Company in Georgia Power, PG&E in the West Coast. Um, and so and they're very monopolistic. Can, yeah. And how can you possibly be an entrepreneur and an innovator in that space? So I almost gave up. But uh, I, I kept pressing on it because I felt like there's got to be something here. And that's when the epiphanies went off. And that's where I think I can really answer the questions you're asking. Um, what I realized was that there is an interesting pattern where electricity <laughs> markets are going to evolve, electricity technology are going to evolve as the computer industry did, as the uh, internet industry did. And and here's one of the main points that I found, uh, I kind of uncovered. I, I didn't make it up, but I really highlighted it in the book. 
Solar and batteries are technologies, not fuels. So let me okay. unpack that. Because That's a paradigm shift, sure. Yeah, and if you're in the energy industry, whether you're pumping oil out of the ground to power cars or you're getting uh, natural gas and coal out of the ground to power power plants to, to, to provide electricity, the 100, 200 years we've been doing this, this is a fuels-based business. You know, how cheaply can I get the stuff out of the ground? Can I get the piece of ground the stuff is in? How do I get it from that place to wherever someone's going to use it, refine it, clean it? You know, <clears throat> actually, they don't clean it. They just throw it in the atmosphere or about behind the coal plant. But <coughs> generally speaking, um, whether it's uranium or natural gas, it's the same business model. And so the industry's had century and a half of getting excellent at refining that business model. And along comes this thing that really no one has their head around. Solar and battery, not wind. Solar and batteries are technologies. And what does that mean? Well, that means that solar panels and batteries are made in the hundreds of billions. You know, um, they they make them in massively automated factories all over the planet. And with the, just like your iPhone, just like your flat screen television, when you have a technology-based product, every couple of years, it gets cheaper and better because you're making more and more of them. Economy, I call it economies of volume. Uh, some people call it rights law. Uh, the computer industry thinks of it as Moore's law. Uh, but the, the idea is the same. The more you make of something, the better you get at it. And just to really put that in context, some fun numbers, right? So, so okay, we're going to make more solar panels, solar cells, and we're going to make wind turbines. But And we're going to make more wind turbines, and we're going to make nuclear plants. So just put some numbers to it. Like if you look at all the nuclear plants built, and a lot of people love nuclear because it looks like it's clean and it's baseload and all these positive things, but we've only made 440 nuclear plants in the history of humanity. We haven't had a chance to get really good at it. Um, oh. and, and it takes 10, 20 years to make each one. Here in Georgia, we're working on it for, what, 20 plus years? <laughs> and and your and my bill is already going up <laughs> even before the thing's live. Right. Um, and so uh, we have maybe t uh, 2,000 coal plants across the planet, maybe 5,000 natural gas plants. And so those remain largely the same. They go up and down depending on the price of the fuel. Then you think about wind turbines, right? So we've made 500,000 wind turbines. And you can make a lot of them in factories. So, so wind has actually been going going down a lot. So, five hundred thousand wind turbines compared to five hundred nuclear plants. That's why wind continues to get cheaper and cheaper. Well, to put that in perspective, since we started making solar cells, we have made one hundred and twenty billion solar cells. Wow! That's why. That's what it means to be a technology. So, the price of a solar cell has gone down four hundred times, and it's not even close to the bottom. Same thing for batteries. We haven't made as many, but we're going to get there soon enough. And so what you're looking at is a complete disruption to a business model that's lasted, protected by monopolies and lasted for a century and a half, uh, really unchallenged. And all of a sudden, you're rolling in a technology that no one's ever seen, no one's ever modeled. And that's what's exciting for entrepreneurs. But the last part, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, wrap up this the answer to the long answer to your question is, but then but people say, and they said to me, Bill, but that's great. But listen, the electric utilities, they're a monopoly. They're, they're not going to open the door. They're, you, you add a new solar cell. They don't care. They actually do. But, but I get the point. Uh, what I realized and really what Freeing Energy, the book, the podcast, the TED Talk, what they were all about was, but when you make the small systems, rooftop, you put a, you put a, a solar panel on a church or a school or a, a shopping mall, uh, on a house, you put batteries in the basement or the garage. Um, those are no longer monopoly markets. I can call three or four companies and say, or 10 companies or 100 companies, I'd like you to compete to get the best solar installation on my roof, please. And and this, so you've got this complete monopoly market on one side for these giant scale electric utilities, but you got this wild west of uh, entrepreneurs on the other side. And that's the part of the market that is absolutely taking off. Yeah. And uh, that's where the, it's not just installed solar, it's the entire ecosystem of um, all the its products, its services, its um, uh, electric vehicles, its charging, all, all these things where consumers can make decisions outside of the monopolies. And this is actually going to be the largest disruption in business history. Yeah, so that I've had some other guests that we've kind of touched on some of the challenges and I listened to a lot of podcasts on the topic myself. And so one of the things you, this regulation piece of it, right, that it, like it, for example, my understanding is with Georgia Pacific, um, the only way, the way they are able to um, increase their rates or grow their profit, they have to put new 
new equipment in, but re, but that but it's based off of old um, fossil fuel and not necessary. They don't the the industry itself doesn't count renewables the same way as it counts the traditional coal and natural gas or things like that when it comes to infrastructure investment by these power companies is that is that true is it my understanding on that you know the imagine you had 130 years since thomas edison turned on the first grid in manhattan to fine tune the question you just asked. <laughs> and you have tens of thousands of the smartest lawyers and academic PhDs thinking about how do you answer the question you just asked. So the, the short answer is it's pretty complicated. Uh, generally speaking, uh, electric utilities don't like change because they don't they get punished if they put up a solar panel, it doesn't work. They really know coal plants, natural gas plants pretty well. So they're much more comfortable. That's the biggest reason. Okay. They're kind of getting their heads around solar and wind. So they're actually adopting it pretty quickly, um, even here in Georgia. So okay. it, it, not as fast as the environmentalists would say we need, but uh, it is definitely getting adopted at a pretty good rate. Okay. Uh, so I think the utilities are part of the solution, which is definitely not a popular point of view with some people, but I happen to think utilities play a critical role, Yeah. Uh, but maybe a different role than they would prefer to play. <laughs> That's right. probably the bad news for the utilities. Yeah, because it's the grid. I mean, right. we utility need companies create the grid and it's um, the reality is because of the nature, you know, as battery technologies get better and you can store that energy, the biggest problem is the storing of it, but it really helps with, offsetting of use of fossil yes. fuels for this, right? And so I know in some and it's communities, cheaper. right, exactly. So, you know, this idea of, of populating, like particularly there's a been a there was a company that was coming around, they were really trying to get uh K through 12 school systems to put yes. the solar on top um and uh and being able to then you know only use they can like it can pays for itself, and in mm -hmm. some communities, they allow you to fuel the the power consumption from your own solar. Like you become part of the grid itself, and then others prohibit that. I, I may not be saying no, that correctly, but I think a hundred percent of the uh, it's a sad fact, but the truth is that almost every solar installation in the United States and the world is connected into the grid, and the term is a grid connected solar, and so. Uh, people miss that because they think, hey, I'm going to put solar on my roof and I'm going to go off grid. And that's actually what got me initially interested in the space is like, how cool is that? I can buy my own utility. And for a lot of reasons, which is some of it's technical, some of it's legal, um, that's probably still a few years away. Uh, what's what's really exciting is that uh, the two weeks ago, the uh, the Congress and the president passed a new law and it actually helps particularly schools and other nonprofits to have a fair, the same kind of economic opportunities for solar that previously only homeowners and uh, businesses had. So I think we're going to see schools and, and uh, churches and other nonprofits take off with solar. Yeah. And so let me just make sure I understood. So I know going completely off the grid and being self-sufficient is, is a stretch, but does like in Georgia, let's just like do say Georgia, because I know different states are different. Does is it a statewide or or municipal wide where it does it fit or is that I like if I am a school and I have excess capacity of my solar, I could feed it back into the grid yes. for other people to use. Yes, the, for that's Georgia always power the case. OK, 100 percent of the cases. But here's the here's the rub. The amount that the utility pays you for what you send back in the grid is the uh, it's the most contentious, uh, more picket signs in front of governor's offices uh, than any issue in the entire solar thing, except for uh, climate uh, related things. So, like, for example, historically, when you think about climate related stuff, the it, you think about it as partisan. So, hey, the, the Democrats love to do this stuff and the Republicans don't. But what's so cool about what in the book uh, I call local energy is that both political parties, everybody likes the small scale stuff. And there's no better example of that uh, than Florida. So the utilities don't like it because that means they're selling that homeowner less electricity. And sometimes they even have to buy it back from the homeowner, which they yeah. really don't want to do because they already got plenty. 
And so they, they, and they're in electric utilities are depending on which numbers you use, either the largest or the third largest lobbyists in terms of budgets of any industry in the United States. And so they have a lot of influence and they, they use it for good, but they also use it to their own advantage. So they, they uh, helped, I say helped in air quotes, they wrote a bill for the Florida legislator that basically made solar uneconomic for rooftop owners and schools and things like that. And so it, it looked like a solar tax actually. And uh, so everybody expected, who didn't really understand the difference between local energy and utility scale clean energy, that of course uh, the very Republican governor of Florida would ve would endorse it. Full, of course he would. He vetoed it. He vetoed a 100% along party lines uh, bill that would have shut down local energy, rooftop solar in Florida, and he vetoed it. And of course, everyone's like, whoa, this is new. What happened? Why did you do it? And he said, listen, the polls are clear. 85% of Floridians want rooftop solar themselves. I said, it's one of the most popular things we're going to do. I'm not going to get in the way. Uh, and uh, that's that's the what, one of the reasons I wrote this book is that people get all confused about what we're actually talking about. So, for example, in my book, I don't use the phrase climate change. You will not hear me talk about in the book that carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases are going to destroy the planet. I happen to think they will, um, but that's not the point. The point of this book, Freeing Energy, is that this is a phenomenal business opportunity. This is like if you could go back in 1993, Karen, and say there's going to be this thing called the Internet. You should take a look at it. So <laughs> that's kind of what I feel like I'm doing. Now, maybe I'm wrong. But I've researched this pretty hard. So I feel like I'm, I'm in 1993, 95, saying there's this new thing coming. It's going to change everything. And people looking at you like, wait a minute, isn't that dial-up modems? Isn't that crazy slow? And yeah, but the technology is going to get better so much faster. It's going to change everything. And that's kind of where we are in this local energy world. And that's why I wrote the book. And particularly, with I, 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 the reason I was so excited to talk to you and share with your with your listeners is that the book is dedicated Opening part of the book is dedicated to the 10,000 innovators and entrepreneurs that will, in the future, join the industry and change the world. Okay. Okay. We're going to lead, go into that question, but I want to tell everybody, freeingenergy.com. That's where you go get access to your book, the podcast, everything, yes. right? And you so can buy the book anywhere. I mean, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your local bookseller. We have hardcover, softcover, uh, ebook, Kindle, and my for people like me that love to listen, we have a great audio version of the book on Audible. Okay, good. So freeing, F-R-E-E-I-N-G, energy.com. So, well, let's talk about those 10,000 future entrepreneurs. How does, because traditionally people have thought of it as there's so much cost associating to developing the technology yeah. And then and proving it out and getting it to market, you know, for many years, you know, those would be the kind of things that are coming in. Are you are you talking about those kind of entrepreneurs because there's these these incentives through the government yep. or other like to explain how do you get started in climate tech as an entrepreneur? That is the best question. And that's why I wrote the book, because. A lot of people look at it, they read some article and it says, oh, there's a new battery coming out and you can charge your car in two minutes. It's going to let your car drive 2000 miles. Well, what, what do you do with that? Right. First of all, that company's never going to see the light of day. Uh, it's a lab experiment. No one's got a battery that good and no one will in the immediate term. But what I tried to lay out in the book, it was the answer to that question, because even venture capitalists I've talked to over the years, they say, hey, it's clean energy. It's clean tech. This is interesting. That's interesting. But they're not thinking through the the harder question of how do you finance it? How do you, how much capital is it going to take? So I created something that really a, the biggest part of the book is about, I call it five orders. And, okay. and then when you look at a clean tech opportunity as an investor, or as a, you want to join as an employee or start a company, you can fit the clean energy thing you're thinking about into one of the five orders. The first order is what you said, Karen, that's what most people think about. Like I'm going to make a better battery. Uh, that is a hard business. And that's something where you probably want the government involved because the government gives away tons of money for this stuff, tons. And, and anyone that's raising pure venture capital to make a battery is just not yeah. spent three <laughs> seconds with the Department of Energy who's, who just gives you money. I mean, I'm not kidding. No exaggeration, no loans, no equity. They just give you the money um, because that's, you know, crazy cool thing about it be America is that we just we want to see this stuff the government gets behind it where regardless of who's running the country yeah parties in control they've always done this they do they do it for oil and gas too um 
And so uh, the second thing is where you take second order is where you take those batteries and those cell, solar cells and wind turbines and you turn it into something that no one's seen before. My favorite example: think about a Tesla car. Go back to the you know early to, early two thousand tens when those were coming out, and Elon Musk and the team JB Straubel were sitting down looking at I want to make a car. Now, did they have some engine, that, a motor that no one had ever seen before? Did they invent a battery that hadn't been seen before? No, it was the opposite. They had this crazy idea. They were going to take laptop batteries. And everyone said, of course, you can't use a laptop battery to make a car. And they did something. It's one of the biggest points I make in the book. Is they took off-the-shelf stuff that BMW, Ford, Mercedes, everybody had access to. There was, they, they just went to Home Depot and bought stuff off the shelf. They put it together in a way that no one had ever done before, and they made the best car that was ever made. And this isn't what I, my opinion, Car and Driver magazine said that the Tesla Model S was the finest car made in the history of the automobile industry. And the parts they bought to make it were available to every car manufacturer. And you just got to get your head around that. Like that's, that's where so much entrepreneur opportunities exist. You don't have to invent a battery or a new circuit. You just put it together in a way that no one else has done. And that's what's so cool about this industry. Uh, is that you can just put together some batteries and motors and make the best car ever made. And then the third and third order is where you wire together and make a service. The fourth order is where venture capitalists start to get really exciting, where you create technology platforms, trading platforms. Um, and there's so many examples in clean energy and climate tech overall uh, for uh, for fourth order, where you know, there's not a lot of assets. You're using someone else's assets. My favorite example outside of clean clean tech and climate tech is of a fourth order company is Uber. So like that company rewrote all the laws of business, right? They said, we're not going to own a car. Uh, we're not going to own anything. We're just going to put a silly little app on your phone and we're going to go get a bunch of drivers on this side. And we're going to create an experience for passengers on this side. And we, and they completely disrupted the automobile industry just with a little app. That is a fourth order play. Venture capitalists made generational wealth with that play. And there are opportunities like that all over the place for the taking and clean tech. Okay. So, uh, so how is that the trillion dollar startup opportunity? Collectively, collectively. Collectively. Okay. Because now you have, uh, you're the company solar inventions. Are you creating your own innovation or are you looking for innovations to do or this, you know, better mousetrap kind of approach for that or. How are you, you know, I, I, uh, my partner is the CEO of the firm and, and it's a, it's an interesting company and I wouldn't recommend it for most people. Uh, I don't talk about it in the book, but I'm happy to tell you about it because it's pretty interesting. Uh, I'm friends with a scientist who I met while I was researching the book. He had a breakthrough in the way that silicon solar cells are made. And we, uh, went through a couple of years, uh, and got it patented. And, uh, now, uh, we want to, uh, share that patent with people who want to save money and when they're making uh, slightly better solar cells, slightly cheaper solar cells. Uh, and um, it's really the solar. We've been making silicon solar cells for 30, 40 years and no one had come across this. It's not a game changer kind of invention, uh, but it's like um, uh, it's uh, I say it's like making bread. That's just slightly better, slightly tastier. And, and no one thought of it before. So this is a, this is not a breakthrough business. Uh, it's super sciencey, super patenty. I don't really like patents, but in something like this, it's a all you can do. And the only reason I did it was because it had to be done, right? This is a really cool idea, and unless you had a commercial team behind it, it was never going to see the light of day. And and I, you know, we're probably going to give it away to companies in Africa and India that are making solar cells there because uh, for the off grid and lower income, because we we just this is something we wanted to do. We'd like to make money on it so we can build on it, but. Uh, just make the world a better place. The world needs this invention. Yeah. And that where is where you get into the social and economic equity in that, you know, important. because it, it, if, I mean, what we've realized, even though we're a first world country here, the fact that we have so much, so much a part of our country that isn't wired on the internet, isn't connected even in this day and age, right. Fortunately, because of the infrastructure bill, a lot of that's happening in Georgia now that didn't, that, that got derailed um, uh, a many about a decade ago, two decades ago, I guess when uh, um, with the MCI telecom thing happened, we were we were the state of Georgia was about to wire the entire state, and then Governor Barnes lost, and that plan went sideways. Oh, really interesting. Okay, 
Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, we now, but we now are going to be investing in rural Georgia to do that. So we have that issue, but affordable energy, all that stuff. But when you look at third world countries, they have access because cell phones, sometimes they have better connection because the cell phone industry, but they have no energy itself. Right. right and so right. is that why you see this as a really strong play to be able to, to uplift our, you know, across the world that way? Specifically from the solar inventions lens, we're happy to work with, you know, the Chinese companies and Indian companies and American companies just making solar cells. And we're just going to, basically charge a teeny amount of money and they're going to, their profits will go up in a very large way. This is not something we're trying to milk the industry with, which I just don't like that at all. Uh, it has even more benefits for people that uh, are living off grid and, and, and uh, low income parts of the world. So the, that, this, that particular invention of my particular company helps them even more. Uh, but the mission of the book overall, uh, the really cool reason that I got so excited about you know, what I call local energy is that um if you solve the problem for a sub wealthy suburban neighborhood uh, in the U.S., you solve it for a community solar sitting outside an urban city in Detroit or an urban part of Detroit, or you're providing electricity uh, for the very first time to someone who who's never had it in very uh, rural Rwanda. It's the same underlying technology, Karen, and that's what's okay. so cool. No one, no one's pulling this together. This is the same solar cell, no matter where you make it, no matter it's the same exact solar cell all over the world. And all right. when you connect all those lines, you see business models emerging, opportunities for innovation that that people just aren't seeing yet. They think, oh, this is a utility thing and this is a billion dollar project. And and the media talks about the billion dollar project. But if you look at it from an entrepreneur, from a component point of view, uh, you're actually, uh, you could have a business that could simultaneously help the wealthiest parts of the world, the poorest parts of the world, um, politicians of all stripes. I mean, how often can you be in any industry where everyone can be a customer and everything you do is going to make the world better for your children and grandchildren? That's what this is so exciting. Um, and if you look at it purely from the, we got to pass giant laws to, you know, to give away wind and solar, which is how a lot of conservatives see this stuff, then of course it's a debate. It's going to be slow, right? But if you come at it from an entrepreneur's point of view, there's no, there's, there's just nothing in your way. Well, I think what you said at the start that as a technology, it's consistently been coming down in the cost, the economies of scale in that is, is for real. So uh, I guess last question, and then we'll, I'll let you say whatever you need. We got about five minutes. Um, Cause I just say, where is the U S compared to the world when it comes to advancement in renewable energy, such as this are, are we just sort of in the middle of the pack? Are we leading the way? You know, great question. And I, I tell you, it depends on the lens you use. But I think even most lenses were middle of the pack at best, right? So the the one area we're really good at are scientific and governmental institutions like the national labs. We're best in the world. If it comes to inventing a new energy technology, including ones for fossil fuels, no one can touch us. And the bad news is that a lot of companies uh, legitimately and fairly license that and they go take it and they build it somewhere else. Uh, and so we don't create American jobs and we've created zero incentives for American jobs until two weeks ago. Yeah. That that new just... law came out. We have big incentives for American jobs now. Uh, I think someone from another country could actually say that it's even unfairly tilting towards the United States. And I'm like, oh, okay, we are the United States, right? Yeah. So uh, uh, it's still fair. There's opportunities for every country in the world um so I, I yeah i think that um how we build it is the most exciting story that's going to emerge uh, i mean there's so many different ways to look at it in terms of uh, so the united states is way behind in how we build it uh but i think the government's finally doing something this is what governments should do you can't make solar cells in my opinion profitably anywhere unless you have the government kind of at least getting out of your way um and Europe's doing the same thing the U.S. is. Uh, and to be clear, early solar cell manufacturing was all U.S. and Europe. And and China came in and took it over. I talk about in my book whether that was fair or unfair and what they did, but that's another debate. Where the United States, I think, is also behind is uh, recognition that this is not just a utility business. So in, And so, for example, in Australia, 
uh, where the number of household rooftop solar uh, is five, six times more than the United States per capita. And like, uh, Karen, if you put up solar, uh, if, we, if you and I lived in Australia, uh, you put solar on your roof and I have batteries in my basement, you and I can trade, I can share, I can share my batteries with you. You can give me your excess solar. We can do that all day long. It's perfectly legal. Uh, just like you and I could do if I had, uh, you know, I was selling donuts or I made a steak or I, you know, I wanted to sell you my, my used stereo or my Xbox, right? You and I can just go as neighbors, we can go and do whatever we want, but in the United States, absolutely full stop, completely illegal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but Australia, like bring it on. And so one of my favorite stories is, uh, there's a beer, a top beer company in Australia and they trade solar power with their customers and they call it, instead of calling it peer to peer, they call it peer to beer. <laughs> uh, you actually trade your excess solar instead of getting a check from the utility you give it to your favorite beer company and then you go into the local beer joint and they'll give you a beer uh, that you're credited for so all this crazy entrepreneurial stuff happens when you and when you, you loosen just a little bit the government controls on this so we're behind there too uh, uh, I think the US is going to catch up a lot with this new law that's the good news And uh, but I think where the United States is going to completely lead uh, and is already leading is an entrepreneurial stuff Okay. Uh, but there's just not enough people to know about it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So everybody, please, please go get the book freeing and uh, educate yourself on this topic. Uh, it is the wave of the future without a doubt. If you're going to skate the, the, the whole thing and skate, I'm not the sport thing. I'm not even, you know, skating to the puck. Right. Wayne Gretzky's fa my favorite quote of his. Yeah, you know, you got to, well, it's also what uh, venture capitalists try to do, right? Yes. Anticipate yes. where it's going. That's why I always use it as that context. And this is where it's going. It, one, it's a critical need. And, and, and there's a lot of people, very passionate people out there trying to solve our energy issues and the impact on the environment. And so when you have a lot of great, motivated, passionate, and intelligent people working on stuff, it tends to have, it tends to get solved. And yes. so that's that it's going that way. So investors and entrepreneurs out there, uh, you know, go check out the podcast and all that stuff and learn what you Thank can you. figure out what you can do with that. So anything we got just under a minute, what would you like to say, Bill? If you look at all the venture capital invested across the world for the last 25 years, total massive number $1 trillion, the newest numbers about client clean tech is it's going to be between seven and nine trillion per year. Wow. There you Biggest go. Biggest investment opportunity in history, entrepreneurs, uh, people that listen to your podcast, folks, this is going to be so fun. It's hard. Uh, there's a lot of great books uh, and podcasts besides mine, but go get educated. Come on, join the revolution. That's my pitch. Excellent. 